Well, good morning, and thank you so much for coming today. It's absolutely wonderful to see this room packed full. Um, my name is Alex Patterson. I'm the Engagement and Heritage Director here at Brooklyn's Museum. And I'm really pleased to welcome you all here on this very special day, celebrating the centenary anniversary of the last Landspeed record to be set on a closed circuit track here at Brooklyn's on the 17th of May, 1922. Now, it is really important that we keep these past endeavours alive, remembering that 100 years ago, these brave individuals were pushing what was then new technology to its limits, to set new records and to continue humans' insatiable quest to be the fastest on land. Competition was, and still is, a catalyst for innovation. At Brooklyn's Museum, anniversaries such as Ken Elmley Guinness's achievements in the 350 Sunbeam are vital. They help us to connect the next generation to the past. By using the legacies of motoring greats such as Guinness, we can inspire and ignite passion in young people to become the next generation of designers, engineers and drivers at a time when motoring and many other techno technology and engineering sectors are going through a new technological evolution. Shortly, you're going to be hearing from our three speakers, each exploring fascinating angles related to the people and the car behind the record. We will then ask you to move to the finishing straight, where four school groups are going to compete against one another, all inspired by the record achievement of Guinness in the 350s Sunbeam. These groups have taken part in a pilot project that has seen them visit, seen them visit the National Motor Museum Beauty to learn about land speed records and have a chance to get up close and personal with some of the most iconic cars of land speed history. Each group has been given an identical remote control car, minus its coachwork, and they've been given a set of rules and regulations on what they can and can't do to design and build their own version of a competition car. They've had two weeks to prepare, and today they are here to compete in the spirit of land speed record and in front of a crowd to see who will be the fastest. This has been an exciting collaboration that has been enabled through the land speed record centenary, and students and teachers alike have become immersed in this fantastic history. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to thank our project partners who have made this day and supported us and contributed to, to this fantastic event. I'd like to say thank you to the National Transport Trust, the National Motor Museum Trust, Steam Dreams Rail Company, and of course the home team here at Brooklyn's Museum. Much time and energy has gone into to mark this special day, and I'm truly grateful to everyone who has been involved, making this a fitting celebration to those bold pioneers of speed 100 years ago. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Oliver Hill. Um, I would like to say that we'll probably take questions at the end, so we'll go through the speakers, and if anybody has a question, we'll, we'll try and answer them before we need to go out to the finishing straight. But I will now hand over to Oliver Hill. Oliver. Um, yeah, my task this, this morning is to introduce you to the, the people behind the 350 horsepower. Uh, the, setting up the records 100 years ago. But it's been uh, suggested that I should also mention that this uh, we, we've got descendants here from all the people involved. And it would be fitting to, to salute. I mean, we have here in the front row, I think, an unprecedented gathering of Guinness descendants um, uh, that we have here, which is wonderful. Um, but we've also got uh, descendants of Malcolm Campbell, who, who had the car afterwards. Uh, we've got descendants of uh, John Marston, who was the founder of the Sunbeam Company. Uh, we've got descendants of, of uh, Jack Ridley, who was one of the leading mechanics that I'll, I'll talk about later. We've got Lord Montague, of course, who was, looks after the car, but who, whose history goes back uh, a long, long way, really. And we've got descendants of, of Louis Coteland, uh, the, the chief engineer. So anyway, welcome to all of those. We have to start, of course, with John Marston, who set up the, the Sunbeam Company. Uh, he started off as a, as a tinware maker, um, doing an enamelware and uh, all sorts of things made out of tin. Um, and then towards the end of the 19th century, when the bicycling was 
high fashion, he moved into bicycle manufacture and uh, I think made his fortune at that point. And by 1900, they were starting to experiment with making motorcars. It was in 1905 that Sunbeam was floated off as a, a separate company. Um, the bikes, the motorbikes and the radiators that Marston's made uh, remained separate. The, the motor car company was set up as a, as a separate limited company in 1905. Um, and th th that was when they became to seriously uh, become motor manufacturers. But it was in 1909 they employed this man, Louis Cotillon, as chief engineer, and that was when things really, I was going to say, started to go wrong. It started to go quickly, is the would be better expression. Um, he was fascinated by, by motor racing and instantly started to test the, the cars that they were making in competition. Uh, he was French trained at one of the, the leading French um, engineering establishments in Cluny, but came to England in, age 21 uh, in 1901 because he thought the, the opportunities here were, were greater and uh, no one would notice that he hadn't got the proper certificate to, to go with his exam results. Um, he, he designed and built a number of one-off special racing cars and Brooklyn's was really his development centre. Uh, the factory of course was in Wolverhampton but it was here that he came to test and to, to develop um, his, his not, not only his racing machines but also his production cars. At the top you see a car called Nautilus um, which was experimental from a point of, from an aerodynamic point of view um, but it was also the engine design was one of the earliest that had four valves per cylinder. It, it wasn't very successful. The, the, uh, the nose cone didn't let enough air through and, and the thing overheated all the time. And so it didn't last very long. But the, the bottom picture is, shows a, one of the standard 1216 production cars, basically, stripped for racing. And, and these were, um, Kotlin was very successful with these. He was so successful, in fact, that he entered a, a team of the cars for the French Grand Prix in 1912. Um, concurrently with the Grand Prix, there was a race for three-litre cars, and the Sunbeams uh, were in this class. But they finished third, fourth, and fifth in the Grand Prix itself, uh, racing against 14-litre Fiat's and 7.5-litre and Peugeot's. Um, and that was a huge victory for Zambian um, and made Cotillon's reputation, I think. By, um, yeah, but by the beginning of the First World War, Zambian had become grown to be the fourth largest car maker in, in the United Kingdom and was employing thousands of people. Cotillon quickly recognised that record breaking was also good for publicity. And he was the first man to put an aero engine in a car chassis and to race it here at Brooklands. This one had a, a 9 litre V12 um, and it was brought here for, for tuning and testing. The, testing aero engines in the air was quite risky at that point and so it was, it was safer to uh, run them on the track to make sure they were working properly. Uh, Chassin, Jean Chassin, who you see at the wheel, um, he put up the fastest lap at 118 miles an hour already in, in 1913 and he took the record for uh, the one hour record putting up uh, 108 miles in, in the hour. <coughs> During World War I, somebody built a variety of, of aero engines, mostly large ones, and supplied the Royal Naval Air Service and the design of the 350 horsepower car that we celebrate today is really based on, on that experience. Um, just as an aside, oh no, you can't see. Uh, top, I was going to say top left is the first um, biplane, a pusher biplane, a farm and pusher -like biplane that somebody bought uh, to test their engine. And the, the works pilot was um, 
Jack Alcock, whose statue is just round the corner there. In 1920, um, some being amalgamated with Darak of Paris and Talbot of London, and they formed what was known as the STD Group. Uh, they, there were a number of other companies within the group, but those were the, the main uh, marks that we, we remember today. And Coatlin was then responsible for racing activity for the entire group. Um, this picture shows the beginning, the start of the 1923 Grand Prix, uh, which was the first won by Sunbeam, and it was the first British car ever to win a Grand Prix, uh, something that wasn't repeated for, for a long, long time. This picture actually doesn't, doesn't see this. Seagrave drove the winning car, but the, this picture shows uh, Guinness uh, at the start um, in front of everyone else, which is good. <coughs> As I said, record breaking was, was very good publicity, um, and Sunbeam were to capture the world land speed record five times between 1922 and 1927. Um, Today we celebrate the, the first occasion when, when the record was set up here. Um, but this picture shows the last occasion when Seagrave exceeded 200 miles an hour on Daytona Beach. Please note that standing next to Seagrave, uh, who was there in the white overalls, is KLG, Kenan Guinness, who was there as, as support, moral support, I think, for, for Seagrave. The cars were, were looked after by key mechanics, Bill Perkins and Jack Ridley. And they were the ones who tuned the, the 350 horsepower. Um, these, these men are often forgotten, um, and many of them were not even known by name. We're fortunate that we, we know quite a bit about both Perkins and Jack Ridley. Um, Perkins often acted as riding mechanic to KLG in, in Grand Prix and other races and Ridley was a key member of the racing team throughout the 1920s. But the most important man to remember today is Kenan Lee Guinness and he was known as Bill but I was thinking I think it's a bit familiar I never met the man so I, I, work, I shall just refer to him as KLG I hope you don't mind. He started out uh, when still a student at Cambridge, I think, helping his elder brother Algie with the 200 horsepower Darak V8, which we also have here today, which is wonderful. Um, he's, he spent a lot of time worrying about improving sparking plugs and eventually uh, set up the very successful KLG spark plug factory at Kingston. But his relationship with Cotillon goes back as far as 1908. Um, they raced together on the Isle of Man, uh, driving Hillman Cotillon cars. <coughs> Not very successful that year. And then from 1913, KLG became a regular driver for Sunbeam, uh, record breaking at Brooklands and, and driving in Grand Prix. His first major victory was in 1914, when he came, won the Isle of Man Tourist Trophy race. And in the centre there, you see Cotillon congratulating Guinness after after the finish of the, that event. As soon as racing started again after the First World War, KLG was back in action um, as soon as it was possible. There's, there's not time to go through all his racing successes, but perhaps just to highlight that I think 1922 was his best year. As well as setting up the land speed record here, he was very successful with the one and a half litre Talbot Darroch uh, racing cars. Um, uh, there was usually a team of three cars, and he won the 200 mile race here at Brooklands in 1922. He also won at Le Mans in the Voiturette race and the Spanish Peñarin Voiturette Grand Prix. So it was, it was really quite a, a grand slam. Sadly, 1924 brought his racing career to an end. 
on a very slippery track in the Spanish Grand Prix, his son being hit a ball. Um, both he and his mechanic were thrown out, and the mechanic, Tom Barrett, was killed. KLG was badly injured, and although he recovered, he never raced again. So I'd like to finish with this picture of, of today's hero, which to me seems to sum him up. He was a very capable and brave driver. And what strikes me is the contrast between today's Grand Prix drivers um, and this man in a tweed jacket with a tie and a pullover and a little knitted hat setting off to race round the circuit. You have to remember that it was also highly likely that a tie would burst while he was out on the circuit. Um, uh, so he was risking his life regularly and frequently. Today we salute you, sir, and all the team. Thank you. now ask Andy Bishop, Director of Collections and Engagement from the National Motor Museum Beauty, to take the stage. Hello, thank you Alex. Good. Absolutely delighted uh, to be here with you uh, this morning uh, as we all come together uh, to celebrate the centenary of the 1920 350 horsepower Sunbeam taking its first world land speed record in this very place. Very, very special day. Now, the 350 Sunbeam is on permanent display at the National Motor Museum at Bewley, and its history can be uh, traced right through the, the breadth of all our designated collections. The Brooklyns and the Campbell years, of course, are the best well known, um, but we can evidence much more than that. And the history of the car itself is one of many different changes in drivers, especially in its early career. Dramatic changes in fortune throughout its life, uh, a life uh, a long life and, and uh, that continues today and changes in design and equipment as well especially in the Campbell years changes of ownership too latterly so uh, a, a very interesting and very diverse life the car has led um, in the 15 or so minutes we have this morning I'm going to race through hopefully I won't have to leave any bits out but you never know um, what I'm going to do is to select highlights that illustrate the story and I'll be using the library, the photographic uh, the film and the object collections at Bewley as we piece together the detail of the story. There are sh there, there'll be snapshots only viewed through the lens of those collections. So that's the approach that we're going to take. So I'm going to start at the beginning uh, with this lovely uh, photograph uh, of the Sunbeam taken May, June 1920 uh, in the Moorfield uh, Sunbeam Works. And you'll notice that the car has artillery wheels at this time. And we'll see this photograph again used uh, in a moment in, in, a, in a press article. Lovely photo there of the 18 litre uh, engine, uh, 350 horsepower, uh, V12. Uh, the, uh, the, the banks are inclined, the cylinder blanks at, at, at 60 degrees, and each has a different stroke uh, and a single overhead camshaft. And uh, very complicated engine, Doug will tell you that, and that's as technical as I'm going to get, but that's a, 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 lovely, a lovely image. And we've heard already that this car didn't start the aero engine uh, you know, racing in, in cars, but it did popularise it, so it's a very important vehicle. There was loads of press interest, there was loads of, uh, loads of interest and uh, support for this, this wonderful new car that was going to appear and do wonderful things. And we can see a few examples here from well-known motoring journals that uh, we can find in our library at Bewley. Three miles a minute. Um, and uh, then an another article from the motor uh, that overestimates the power of the car, but nevertheless gives us some lovely images of the chassis and the engine. And, uh, and then this piece uh, from the auto car. And uh, that's that image that you saw in the photograph in the previous slide. So lots and lots of interest in the potential of this wonderful new car. These images uh, show the, uh, the unfortunate reality uh, following all that press hype of, of the first appearance uh, at Brooklands. And really, um, from 1920 and into the earlier part of 1921, the car had some mixed luck uh, with different drivers at the helm, very inconsistent performance. Uh, during practice for its debut, uh, debut race at Brooklands, 19th of June, uh, 
Uh, sadly, um, Harry Hawker uh, crashed at 80 mile an hour. Happily, he wasn't hurt and the car wasn't badly damaged after, but after that crash, those uh, uh, wire, um, uh, the wooden artillery wheels were changed for wire spoke. So uh, this, this image I've included, because the car looks so weird, it looks like a different car, doesn't it? You can see now that it's got um, uh, wire spoke wheels, and uh, this image is uh, René Thomas uh, competing at the Gaylon Hill Climb near Paris in October that year. Uh, he did very well. Uh, but in the photograph, the zombie looks uh, strange because it was rigged up with a second seat and it was carrying lead ballast uh, in lieu of the passenger uh, seat that the rules required. So, uh, into 1921, though, those inconsistencies, as I said, were, were continuing. And um, this little article from the autocar, you can tell that people are, are willing the car to do better. Come on, uh, maybe the next time out, things will, things will be improved. Um, sadly, on, uh, at that, uh, on that occasion, Captain LG uh, Hollinstead had poor results and, and also unfavourable handicapping, so it wasn't, it wasn't to come true. But the reason I, I chose this race is that we've got this, uh, this lovely race card uh, in the collection. Now, I'm sure Brooklyn's have got a much more pristine example than we have. What I like about this is the immediacy of taking you back to this place uh, 100 years ago. Or, well, uh, and more for this one. But um, you can see that the, the chap has uh, wandered around looking at the racing, looking at the form, enjoying the cars. He's folded this uh, race car and popped it in his pocket for convenience. So I think that gives us a lovely uh, immediate and human connection. Uh, from September 21, uh, as I said, the Sunbeam was uh, driven by a number of people with better results. And uh, just highlighting this one with Ken Elm Lee Guinness, uh, had a very successful day at the 1921 autumn meeting. Uh, the left uh, image on the left is from our photographic uh, collection, and I'd always wondered what that um, rather crude paintwork was on, on the image. And you can see uh, from the autocar uh, extract there that it was used to give some really crude highlighting in the uh, uh, to dramatise the image. So, moving on then to uh, the first world land speed record and the reason that we're all gathered here today. And um, Ken Elmley Guinness, of course, took uh, the world land speed record with a flying kilometre of 133.75 miles per hour. And um, in this photograph, you can see that the rear wheels appear static. You can't see the spokes. That's because they're turning already. And uh, the car is, is getting ready for the off. The front wheels, uh, by contrast, appear to be still. Um, in this uh, image here, you can see that there was rubber left on the track as the car pulled away, uh, and uh, the timing tape was also uh, damaged but still operable. So again, much like that image previously, I think there's an immediacy here. You can almost uh, hear that the, the, the car as it's revving and ready to go, smell the, uh, the burning rubber as the car took off. So, uh, so some lovely things in the collection that can bring things to life. So, um, if we move on to Malcolm Campbell, uh, 1923, um, uh, he borrowed the car to go to uh, Saltburn Speed Trials in June 23, and he set an unofficial World Land Speed record there. Uh, he rather liked it, so then he purchased the car, I don't know how much for, and um, then he took it to Farno and set another uh, unofficial World Land Speed record. And uh, we see the car is now beginning to change in this lovely uh, image that's annotated by Campbell that's in our photographic collection. And there's a union flag has appeared on the scuttle and those famous sunbeam words have now disappeared from the bonnet. So 1924, obviously major modifications with, with Campbell. Uh, happened during the, the first half of the year. So the body was significantly modified as recommended by uh, aeronautical engineers uh, Bolton and Paul of Norwich. Uh, the car was tested in a wind tunnel, uh, and uh, the body was built by Jarvis and Sons of South Wimbledon. The new streamlined body had a wider cockpit, a longer tail, uh, fared in headrest and rear springs, and the detailing was so precise that even the external handbrake had a little aerofoil fitted to it. Uh, ace wheel discs were fitted on and off, Campbell tried lots of different configurations, um, and this is how the car appeared at the Skegness uh, Speed Trials. Um, Skegness speed trials 
uh, on uh, the 21st of June 24. So we know all those modifications were done were done by then. So the first official world land speed record uh, at Pendine, 25th uh, of September uh, 1924. Uh, flying kilometre 146.16 mph. In the top right photograph, we can just about make out the words Blue Bird painted in small lettering on the sides of the radiator cowl. And uh, this curved metal uh, wind deflector attached. Campbell tried all sorts of different configurations of the car. Some uh, exhausts on, a wind deflector on, um, wheel discs on, uh, all sorts of things. Minor, minor changes just to get the most out of, uh, out of the car. And this is the, uh, the form of the car today, the 1924 uh, form of the car. Um, for the Skegness speed trials on the 25th of, uh, sorry, on the 8th of June 25, the car was still in this guise, so we know uh, it was looking like this up until June uh, 25. So then we move on to uh, the other world record that, uh, that, that, that Campbell took at Pendine when he uh, significantly pushed through the 150 um, mile an hour barrier. Uh, you'll notice that the car has uh, changed again now. Um, there's a longer radiator cowl, the exhaust pipes on off back. Uh, new pistons have also been fitted to raise the compression of the engine at this time. Uh, the rear spring fairings are removed and the car is now clearly painted all blue. And uh, Campbell then uh, took uh, his first two unofficial records and the first two of his nine official world land speed records in this car. Now, uh, rather like these images on the right there, uh, they were taken on the 21st of July 2015 at Pendine, uh, when we uh, got in the, uh, the business of trying to recreate historic photographs. We ran the car along the beach 90 years to the day that Campbell had taken the record. It was a very emotional uh, day, much like today actually. And uh, Don Wales was there to help us, and he drove the car as well. And as you can see, he looked very much like his grandfather. So just before uh, we leave this section, I wanted to um, let the object collection get in on the act as well. Some lovely uh, models here. This is a scratch-built model, I think, of 1924 Bluebird. It's about 1 to 24 scale. And uh, this is a 1 to 43 scale model of 1925 Bluebird. And I think very eloquently those two models show the changes that the car uh, went through with, with Malcolm Campbell. So, uh, we'll race on now through the, uh, the latter history of the car. Um, following the record-breaking successes, Campbell uh, sold the car for uh, £250 in 1925 uh, and part exchange uh, of Ralph Aspden's Grand Prix Vauxhall as well. And uh, this, uh, this image shows him at Southport Sands, and uh, in an article in uh, Motorsport in 1958, he reckoned he used it occasionally on the roads as well, which must have been quite hair-raising. Uh, the selling price is referred to in this letter from Malcolm Campbell to Harold Prattley. It's dated 13th of April 1944, and this is from our archive at the museum. And in that letter, Campbell stated that uh, he'd offered the car to Parry Thomas, uh, or that Parry Thomas, rather, had offered him £1,500 for the car in 1923. And uh, Campbell also said that the original tail was probably still in the car, that it contained the, contained the petrol tank, and he built the longer tail over it. And indeed, uh, Doug, that's what you found, wasn't it? <laughs> so, changes in ownership. Um, Jack Field of the Sunbeam for a short time, from July 1934. At that time, the car was painted all white. Um, and whether or not he owned it, I don't know. Uh, maybe some of you here uh, might be able to tell me, but uh, Billy Cotton drove the car at Southport Sands on the 5th of September 1936, the dance uh, band leader. Uh, he did rather well. Uh, and that was the end, as far as I can tell, of Sunbeam's active career. So we move on now to uh, 1941. And Sunbeam was purchased by Mr. Touche Jesson, who stored it in Lancashire. Um, according to him, at this time, the car uh, was in a wonderful state of preservation. The main moving parts appearing to have no wear and to be in new condition. And the bodywork, with the exception of a few battle scars, was still very good. You can see rather bizarrely it's got a tail fin at this time as well, which is rather strange. <laughs> Harold Prattley, uh, then of uh, South Woodford in London, had been tracking the car for some time, and he finally records finding it on the 2nd of July, 1942. 
had apparently been stored in the open, the unpainted parts had rusted, engine was covered in white powder from decayed aluminium, and um, uh, the copper work had turned green. So very sad, uh, very sad uh, decline. Prattley arranged with uh, Touche Jesson to uh, better store the car on hard ground and to cover the engine. Um, and in October 1943, the, uh, the once proud Sunbeam made its uh, saddest appearance ever in London, uh, in, sorry, in Liverpool. It was uh, towed behind a cart horse to attract attention for books for war salvage drawing. I've never seen a photo of that, but if anyone has one, uh, break my heart as it would, but I would like to see it. Um, by July, oh, let's see now. Um, so, uh, these images, I think, were taken around 1944 when Prattley bought the car from Touche Jesson, and he intended to return it to its uh, former glory. He loaned it to Roots, uh, who cosmetically restored the car for promotional purposes. So, by July 1946, the Sunbeam was returned to its Brooklyn Zero trim of short green painted uh, tail, radiator cowl, with the letters uh, Sunbeam uh, reappearing on the bonnet. And um, in this way, with this cosmetic restoration, it made many um, appearances uh, static, it was always piggybacked or, or towed on a lorry. And uh, one of those uh, appearances was the 1946 Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders Jubilee Cavalcade across our major cities. Um, in London, uh, there was a nice, uh, there was uh, King George V was present and the Queen. Um, and this photograph from the Belfast Cavalcade, I don't know if you could spot the deliberate mistake, but there's a false claim on the side of that lorry that Seagrave drove the car. And here's quite a different program, uh, the Midland Cavalcade, all these are in our library. So the beginning of the Bewley years, and uh, Lord Edward Lord Montague purchased the car in late 1957, and then 58-59 uh, there was a rebuild uh, in the Montague Motor Museum workshops after curator Michael Sedgwick, I never met him, I wished I had, uh, never a man to mince his words, he said the car was near scrap. Uh, when, when uh, it was brought uh, to the museum. The bottom left photograph uh, was taken uh, in the Montague, the new Montague Museum in 1959, and the bottom with Edward Lord Montague, the bottom right, was taken probably in the early 1960s. So uh, at this time, the car is in good shape, uh, it's on display in the museum, it's making a few guest appearances at Alton Park and, uh, and Goodwood. Last time out, as far as I can ascertain, this was the last time out of the, of the car. It was the uh, Festival of Motoring at Goodwood on July 14th, 1962. Uh, Lord Montague drove it on a, a three-lap demonstration run with um, uh, problems from the gearbox, as, as was the car's habit. Uh, and uh, this uh, is a lovely uh, image of uh, Donald Campbell with his father's old zombie. He drove it on a lap of honour as well, and Leo Villa is there with CM7. So, um, just before I hand on to Doug, restoration at Bewley. Um, Doug, of course, will take us through that in a minute, but it's not the first time, as we know, the car's been in the workshops at Bewley. As I said, it was rebuilt in 58. Uh, in 59, uh, there was an engine overhaul, new fuel pump, fuel tank, and a truck gearbox was fitted. And then in 1987, the car was uh, completely remodelled and rebuilt to reflect that 1924 record-breaking form with, with Malcolm Campbell. Uh, six years after that, uh, in 1993, the car was prepared for an important Sunbeam anniversary event, at which we hoped it would run for the first time since 1962. Time was tight, uh, but the car was prepared, and we all gathered on the arena at Bewley to hear the mighty roar of the Sunbeam after 31 years of silence. The car ran under its own power for a short time, but then disaster struck uh, as a cod rod and piston pushed right through the sump and crankcase. Uh, the Sunbeam, uh, of course, made many static appearances in the uh, intervening years, but Doug, Stan and the team at Bewley have made the car whole again after a long-term restoration project. So, um, over to Doug. Hello, you can hear me. Hi. So we come to the oily bits, <laughs> and the greasy bits, and the smelly bits, and whatever. Uh, it's that button, which one? There we go, technology. It hasn't got petrol. <laughs> so here is the car, Campbell, Pendine Sands, 
and uh, travelling at a great rate of knots. And I'm looking at it and thinking, well, what wheel spin has he got? What fuel is he running? Um, and where's his hat gone? <laughs> and also, I, I look at these pictures and I think of Ridley and uh, I think of the, the people, Perkins, and, and uh, I think people who looked after the cars and everything. And there's a very young Leo Villa at the back. I'm not sure of the guy sat in the front. But having it been at Pendine Sands as this picture was taken, I know why he's on board. Because he's going to get a wet backside if he isn't. And why is the car not bump started? And you see the famous wet film of the swing starting it, because you couldn't get work, you couldn't get any grip to bump start it. So um, great picture. And why is he sitting on the floor? He's changing the spark plugs. So um, but we um, got the car, this is as Edward Lord Montague um, ran the car in the Lee Guinness style and um, great looking car but yes the gearbox was the Achilles heel and um, it was always failing. Some weird configuration of a live lay shaft with second and third gear all on the main, main shaft, no direct driving top or something, but no records exist, no drawings exist of the gearbox, so that presented a problem. Um, yes, the uh, Conrad and Piston, 18.322 uh, cc through 12 cylinders. That's how big they are. Here's one we broke earlier. <laughs> and Conrods that were built in 1918, 1920, beautiful bit of engineering. Do have a look later. Wonderful, wonderful articulated rod there. Um, however, when they don't want to be in the engine anymore, <laughs> they come out like that. And indeed, there's the other bit. Um, yeah. Not a happy day, but we decided that uh, you know, this car can't sit there. It was sat in the museum with a piece of engine sticking out the side. So we uh, took the took the engine out, um, and that's what it looks like uh, with a lightweight front end. Um, this was in 2006, and that is what the V12 engine looks like out. Now, just very very quickly, I'm very aware of time. We, it could have been an Arab, some being Arab engine, it could have been, some being, uh, they said it could have been a Manitou engine. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong, the Arab was a single overhead cam V8, and the Manitou was a double overhead cam V12. Yeah, good. So, the, the bores, are, or the cylinders, are cast in blocks of three but on the Arab, they're cast in blocks of four. Now, that's a single overhead cam V12, so the, the four cylinder block had a single cam. That's a, four, that's a three cylinder block with a single cam, so it couldn't have been either engine. So, okay, back to the drawing board, trying to find bits and pieces. So we know that there's a very special engine, and there's, it could have been one of the test engines for the air ministry, it could have been an airship test engine, but anyway, no drawings, um, dot com. And that's, that's what it looked like, that was sticking out of the side of the engine. What happened, I feel like sound like Jeffro now, what happened was, um, we had, um, we were given a solvent because the car ran on castrol R and we were given a solvent to flush all the castrol R and we flushed it and flushed it and flushed it but however when we ran it a piece of castrol R, a bit of jelly got in the oil gallery and blocked the oil way. If you look at the next picture you'll see where it punched its way out and that wasn't just a crankcase, it came out through the side of the block as well. Um, so hard, and this was on Tickover Okay. I've got to say, whilst all the press were waiting, uh, and uh, it turned the piston upside down in the bore on Tickover. So that says a testament to the uh, power of the engine. So there's the articulated rod, and the geometry and the, the stroke of one bore is slightly different to the other. Um, these new rods were made by Arrow. And this is a perfect time for me to say thank you. Thank you to the Sunbeam Torbett Direct Register for helping us, supporting us, building the car back up together. 
to particularly Chris Brett, who got the work really, really hard for us. Thank you for, to Lord Montague for allowing us to work on the engine, and, and thank you for letting us have the car here today. If it wasn't for Lord Montague, we wouldn't be here today celebrating with our car. Thank you to everybody, and thank you to my guys. And it's the guys that make the oily things work. And uh, there's Stixie, you're, he's, he's a bloke with a stick, Michael. <laughs> Stan, who's driving it, he deserves to drive it. And all of the volunteers. And over 2,000 hours, two, about 2,300 hours just on the engine, but mainly volunteers. And that's uh, a bit of one. But you're welcome to have a look and see what we've got here. So, and that was a piston that was upside down. Oh, no, that isn't. That is. That's the piston that was upside down. But then we had new pistons. Sadly, the pistons were remanufactured direct copy of the originals, it's not what we asked, so it's still running on high compression. We didn't want that, but still, um, I'm not going to drive it 150 mile an hour, that's for sure. Um, and there's the end of the single overhead camshaft, and we actually found that there was no way of retaining the oil pressure in the, uh, in the camshaft either, in the configuration. But just to show the complexity of what, what was built at the time and what we were faced with, that is one cam gear, and you can see the lightness and whatever, and the cam followers, etc. That's it all. There were new springs, new valves, etc. Reprofiled cam. That's the only drawing we had of the wrong engine. <laughs> um, and if you have a look closely at this, you'll see slightly different bore size, um, block sizes with a different stroke, you see it's not quite square. And then you, there's no timing marks, so if you take a gear off and you turn the engine, you're stuck. Now we couldn't turn this engine, then we couldn't put it in the right place to take it apart. So when we took the timing case off, a lot of the guys went down the pub. <laughs> and I had to get them back. Because they had a face with that lot. <laughs> the only way I could get them back was with donuts. <laughs> So uh, it took a lot, of, a lot of thinking about. Um, this is the, the configuration of the crankshaft, and you can see the residue in the end of the crank of the old Castrol R, and that's what we had to flush out and whatever. And here we have it. Thanks to Formal Engineering, Formal Racing, for doing all the um, the metalling, etc., on it and the white metalling. Um, Terry Formals. <coughs> And you can probably see top left where it's stitched together um, by Sherlock. And it was all metal stitched. You can see the metal stitching there, holding the thing all together. No heat involved, which is brilliant. And then screwing it all together with a nice bit. But then we found there's lots and lots of bits that bolted onto the engine that were falling apart, such as all the waterways, etc. <coughs> now have a look at that picture. Can you see all those little, little bulbs? 2BA, 316, tiny little bulbs. 386 of them. <laughs> Only two came out. <laughs> all the rest broke. Thank God for our volunteers. <laughs> because they made jigs and they actually, we drilled them all out and then retapped them, etc., etc. Hence the hours. And you can't leave it like that because you know all those, those aluminium plates are all corroded. And that's the engine slowly going together, but um, you know, with massive carburetors, etc., etc. And just to show the size of that, um, that carburetor, that is four inches across. So um, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a gas guzzler. And then if you have a look at the Conrods, um, the we actually found that the new rods were slightly different, slightly wider in the throat. And we contacted Arrows and they said, actually, it was an inherent weakness and they would have failed. OK, Sherlock, you worked that one out. <laughs> However, the Conrod didn't fail. And this, when you think of all the running that car did, the Conrods never failed. Those engineers are a lot better than people actually give them credit for. So, so the guys with the oily bits, to our archives, our curators, 
etc., giving us all the information we can. It's interesting there, there's a, there's a, it says a gear for the wireless drive. Okay, no wireless in that one. Um, and then, uh, yeah, how do you, <laughs> an offbeat V12, how do you time that one? Um, but Stan did it. And then a multiplayer clutch you had to deal with. And a really multiplayer clutch. <laughs> and all for rather square footage. But all of that was all stuck solid. We had to soak it for months and months and months. And then the back axle. It, it was a bit squeaky. It didn't sound very oily. Because that's what happened to the oil. And then bronze back bearings. That's what happened to the bronze back bearings. And then, showing the power of the car, and Andrea was saying about the wheel spins and all of that, if you actually look, that's a half shaft, it's twisted. Um, and think of what a great piece of metal that is. But then we had the gearbox issue, and that is the Albion gearbox. And spooky enough, we researched it 35 horsepower that was rated to, a tenth of what the car was needed. We've now got a Bentley C type box, which the is bolted onto the back of a very famous Napier Lion engine and working really, really well, so we knew that would, that would do. We tried so, so hard to actually recreate the original gearbox, but it just wasn't going to happen. So, um, back to the real world. There she is. Um, we are very, very, very proud of that car. And I am very, very proud of those guys, because those volunteers stand out the front. He's driving it today. He deserves to drive it today. Um, to all of you coming, thank you for your support. Thank you to the pioneers of the day, to the families of the pioneers of the day, and to the current record holders, and everybody who supported us in various ways. And we wouldn't have been here today, and we wouldn't be here with, for the car if it wasn't for everybody's efforts. Huge team effort, and thank you to everybody, and thank you for supporting us, the National Motor Museum, and Brooklands, and the Transport Trust. Um, and thank you to Lord Montague for allowing your car here. So, thank you. Thank you everyone for um, some fascinating histories and also um, looking at the story up to date is absolutely amazing. Um, my hat's off to you, Doug. Um, I don't think I can do it all myself. Um, we've probably got enough time for one or two questions before we need to go out. Is there anybody who's got a question for now? I'm sure our speakers will be happy to talk to you afterwards as well. Um, anyone? Excellent. Don't see a hand. No. Oh, there's one there. Yes, sir. How special is the fuel we got? Uh, the fuel we got, and it's too good. Pump fuel at the moment, 95 octane, we've got about 91. Mr. Wynn has given us contact detail of somewhere. We've got a little bit of paraffin in there if you'll just knock it back a bit. But um, yeah, it's, uh, fuel is a constant problem, but yeah, it's, it's too good at the moment. <laughs> Anyone else? Excellent. Um, it is getting close to 12 o'clock, so if I can ask you all to head over to the finishing straight. So there's going to be swords competition there, and then at 12.30 um, till quarter past one, there'll be a series of cars, including the Sunbeam, running. Have a name here as well. Thank you very much.